Hi, everybody. Welcome. I'm Laura Green, the Regional VP of Education and Industry Initiatives at IEB Southeast Asia and India. Thank you so much for taking the time to join us today for the latest webinar in our Revolve webinar series, where we're delighted to bring together experts from across the region to share their research, learnings and experiences from a wide range of topics. Um, if you'd like to be the first to hear about any upcoming webinars, please go across to our website and sign up for our newsletter. Um, I'm delighted this week to introduce you to uh, Monica, um, who's SVP of Client Partners for APAC at Essence, and as well as that, IUB Southeast Asia and India Regional Board Member, and Delbert Tai, Head of Marketing at Circles Life Singapore. Um, one of the interesting things about today's webinar is that um, we all talk a lot about data and how we can utilise it um, in our day to day, whereas actually Circles Life, since its launch in 2016, has been always operating as a digital telco. The only support channels available to customers are live chat, email, and the company has recently expanded its offerings by launching digital lifestyle features. In this webinar, we're going to hear from both Monica and Delbert as they talk through the real life practicalities behind the buzzwords, things like agility, draft, data driven marketing and metrics that measure. Without further ado, I'll hand you over to Monica and Delbert. And if you have any questions at all during the session, please use the Q&A function and we have time left at the end. Over to Thank you, Laura. And hello everyone. I'm Monica Bhatia and I'm currently the Senior Vice President at Essence, leading um, the client relations for one of our largest clients, Google. A large part of my role involves ensuring that we as an agency are working with our clients to meet their business objectives. Um, and to do this, we need to be agile and flexible to the ever-changing landscape that we are in and more so in recent times. I'm always on the lookout to, you know, talk to people from organizations where um, a core of their business beliefs is built on this business agility. And that's why I'm so excited to speak to Delbert today. Um, Delbert is the head of marketing of Circles Live, Singapore's newest digital telco. And I think everyone's going to enjoy this chat today because he has kindly agreed to share some of Delbert uh, Circle Life's secret sauce with us when it comes to marketing. So Delbert, over to you. Give us a little bit um, about yourself and your background. Yeah, thank you, Monica, for the great introduction. Um, I would say, you know, I, I have a pretty unique career, and I'm not just saying that because I think I'm a special snowflake. Uh, I think if I compare to a lot of my peers, my career has been pretty strange. Um, I've only worked for two companies. The first one was Procter & Gamble, where I've spent most of my working life. And the second one is Circle Life. And each and every one of my assignments in P&G, as well as in Circle Life, if you think about it, has been really unique in their own right. The first one I had in P&G was uh, handling laundry in the Philippines. And as you can see, I'm not exactly the typical expert in laundry uh, now i am so that's my uh, that's that's my um, top chore at home so but through my experience in png coming from laundry i had the opportunity to handle hair care uh, home care batteries and from there i was able to um, find circle Life, where I, it's 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 telco and a digital product so if you can see the history there is no common thread as of when it comes to categories. It's all just new and exciting ventures and opportunities for me. So that's been kind of my career so far. And I think what I've taken away from that is there's a lot of commonalities with all these things when it comes to the principles on how you approach business building and brand building. So I do want to share a lot more of those things um, uh, in the next hour. Exciting. And, you know, I, um, it's very interesting for me that, you know, you moved from FMCG, PNG, pretty much the stalwarts of brand building in, um, in the industry to a startup with, um, with Circles Life. And tell us about, you know, what are the similarities and what are the differences between going from an established set organization to, um, to an up, upcoming one. I, it'd be fascinating to hear uh, the differences. 
Yeah, no, uh, I've thought a lot about this very intently, especially before I joined. And one of the things that really came to me as the main distinction is when you're in a established company like P&G, you're faced with a lot of processes, rightfully so. It's a big company, a lot of things are at stake. And what you end up doing, especially if you are as impatient as me, is you're actually figuring out how to break those processes. How can I skip this step? How can I jump ahead of the queue? How can I get my project uh, prioritization? All of these things. And the difference is in a startup, especially one as, as raw as Circle Step when I joined four years ago, you're actually thinking about oh, I think we should have this process and that process. So basically, the, the conclusion I had there is the more processes you break, you're probably not in a startup. The more processes you make, you're probably in a startup. So that's one big thing that really came to me and was quite an interesting observation. The second thing is um, when it comes to how Circus Life approaches business decision making, one of the things that really drew me in and made me feel comfortable uh, and at home to a certain degree in Circle Life, as weird as that might sound, is the founders are from consulting, from very established kind of companies wherein they work through big structures, complicated, um, complicated hierarchies, but at the same time, they've understood the key principles in how to make decisions which is very, very similar with how we make decisions in PNG. So for me, coming in, it was quite uh, a soft landing, I would say, because I can discuss with them and brainstorm and debate all at the first principles level. And the second thing is everything is database. For anyone who is in a CPG background, there's a lot of data, a lot of consumer understanding. And the same is true in Circle Five, if not more, because the data is just overflowing. It's real time. So for us, when we're discussing principles, it's not just discussing principles at a high level, but we're actually connecting that principle to what is happening on the ground. What is the real time sentiment? What is the data telling us? <clears throat> um, I would say when it comes to things that are really um, different between PNG in Circle Step, it's really around the real-time nature of it because it is a digital business. I get data on a, uh, on a real-time basis, so on, a, on like even now if I, I can pull up my phone and I can check how we're doing for the day uh, and I will be either relieved that we're ahead or I will be um, in a place of, of anxiety because I'll be thinking, oh no, no, what's happening, what's happening? is a team on it or not. So this is something that I would say is quite different in a more traditional company where I can launch a big campaign and then when it comes to the market impact, at best, I'll see it a month later when the market share reports come in. So I think that's actually a really, really big uh, distinction. And I, I, I like it because then you feel that what you're doing on a day-to-day -day has the impact that you're looking for. Interesting. So, you know, if I had I, three points that I picked up, and I love the first one um, that you said with regard to processes, that if you're in an organization where you're trying to break more processes, then you're in a well-established organization, a, a large organization. And if you're um, establishing processes rather than breaking, then you're in a startup. That's, that's an interesting uh, one. I think second, which you said in terms of, you know, having a structure, structured approach and looking at the principles to make decisions, I think that's that's really, really fundamental. And then third is is data is everything. So to spend a little bit of time um, on, on data, right? And how this is used with regard to um, decision making. We know that, um, you know, from whatever I've observed is Circles Life has been, um, is is the new entrant on, um, on the block. And so a lot of the approach to marketing is with regard to changing the norm, breaking the clutter, and this requires you to be very agile, um, you know, and do multiple scenario planning depending on how your audiences will react. And um, you have access to a lot of data 
um, to help you make these um, in, uh, decisions. However, like you said, there is data that you have real time. So how do you as an organization strike the balance between making decisions real time and sifting through all of this data so that it is um, not knee-jerk reactions because of the quantum of data that you have access to? Yeah, I think um, one thing that I guess most people might not be aware of, the way we think of circle stuff in, in, in most cases is we liken ourselves to an e-commerce company. So there is a user journey that we think about and try to understand as best as we can. And a lot of the data that we look at on a day-to-day -day basis is concerning this user journey because we are at the fast growth pace across all of our countries. So we're thinking about people coming into the website, trying to understand the plan and making that purchase decision. And because the data is real time, we focus our decision making and, and uh, <clears throat> reports around understanding that flow. So to your question, how do you sift through all this data and how do you make sure that you are looking at the right thing and not get overwhelmed? The way we think about it is it really boils down to where the focus is for the country at that particular point in time. So for instance, in Singapore, where the market is a bit more mature for us, we have a much higher level of awareness. A lot of the focus is around trying to understand what are the questions that people will have once they arrive on the website and how do we optimize that further? So I, I have this example where in <clears throat> it sounds so non-marketing, it sounds so unsexy, but I love it because, you know, at the end of the day, it's, uh, it's, it's something with results, right? So during the onboarding process, when people come in, we realize that when they're about to put their card details, they, there was a huge drop off there. And we were trying to understand why people were dropping off. And one thing that we realized was the presence of that you know, when you have a certain e-commerce page where in, when you put in your card details, it pops in a new window and then you get this OTP on your phone. So this, this shift in the, in the window experience for the customer actually led to a huge drop off because people were, imagine if you're on a phone, right? And how annoying that is. You're on a, you're on a particular page and then you click a button and it opens a new page which looks totally nothing like the previous page so you get disoriented so we thought about that as a as a fix and we switched um, that part into something that is more mobile friendly something that is a lot more um, you know being technical about it it's an inline frame within the page so that actually contributed significantly to the conversion rate and that is a kind of data that we use to understand how we can optimize growth, how we can grow much faster, and, and how, we can, how that growth can arrive at a much more efficient uh, spend. So that one is one of my favorite examples because it's really unsexy. It's not something that you would imagine winning a Khan Award because it's something pretty basic, right? Now, on the other hand, if you look at other countries, like let's say Australia or Taiwan, we're in, our awareness is much lower. We're thinking more about how do we get people to come to the website more? How do we get them to come to the website at a much more efficient rate? So we think about uh, the, the main metric there that we think about is website and bounce rate. Then within website visits, we look at website channels. Are we getting sufficient website channel visits from organic sources? Are we getting too much from paid and therefore are we overspending? Do we need to do uh, interesting activities that are that could potentially be viral, or do we need to ramp up our rest pitching process so that we can get more organic um, activities? So these kind of things actually drive the visit to our website and therefore eventually drive conversions later on. But it's a different stage as opposed to Singapore, wherein we have a much more reliable, consistent clip of visitors coming in because more people are aware of us there. So the way I would uh, think about data, just kind of like uh, summarizing it, is understand which part of the user journey you are and focus the dashboard, focus the reports, focus the analysis on that part 
So then if you're if you have to review something on a day to day or even multiple times a day, you can just focus on that. While other parts you can do a much more longer term view wherein maybe it's once a week, maybe it's once a month. Because while that might be important, you can still have that view in mind. Interesting. And, you know, I think um, the point that you made in terms of the customer journey is, is so important in terms of what stage we are in. But I really like the credit card example um, as well, because I think the focus is really in terms of ensuring that it is a seamless experience for the customer and, you know, not make it at least painful. Um, the other interesting bit that I picked up is, so you actually say that at Circle Life, you look at data um, irrespective of whether it's paid and organic and not separate. Because sometimes I think that's the challenge um, that, that marketers and agencies fail is depending on the agency that's managing it or the clients in terms of who they're engaging with it, look at it in isolation, but one should actually look at it in totality because one complements the, the other. So let us tell us, are there any tools or any dash tip, uh, types of dashboards that you'll use that actually have helped in terms of um, going through all of this data uh, easier? So how is it that how do you all actually visualize and collect all of this information? Um, like I said again, so that you are not taking knee-jerk reactions. If you're getting data on your hands, mm -hmm every one hour and you know you started off a campaign or started off an activity at the start of the day and in the afternoon you're seeing it's not um you know not resulting in terms of how the last campaign was how do you ensure that you don't have the next meeting in the room saying guys this campaign is not working so um how do you strike the balance mm, so i would start with you know on the tools front um i think it's one of those things we're in I wouldn't say we are the best at, we are practical at that because we think about things in a really, uh, still in a startup kind of mindset. How do we do things in, a, in the most hacky way? So we don't have like fancy dashboards and visualizations. In fact, I remember like uh, there's uh, one person who joined the team. He has a very startup kind of background and he was asking, why do you guys all run things on Google Sheets? Uh, there, there's like a million Google Sheets, and uh, and that's that that is an illustration of how I would say unadvanced we are when it comes to that, but more how we're practical about it. So when it comes to specific tools, for us, my at least for me, my best friend, and this is what I tell. Team, their best friend should be the analytics platform that we use. In our case, it's Adobe Analytics. And the thing there I implore everyone is, no matter which level you are in the organization, you need to learn these things. You need to learn how to run these things. Because the speed in decision making is directly correlated with the speed of information getting to the decision maker. It sounds so obvious, but if decision makers are relying on a particular intern analyst to come up with a report, then that is a huge bottleneck in the organization. So in my case, I had to learn all of these things from scratch. Yeah, I find it fun. And in fact, one of the things that um, I, I, I had to figure out was there's particular kind of data that, can, that is not tracked on our analytics platform, but it's in our um, um, data warehouse where it, for me to access it, I need to actually code in SQL. And coming from PNG, that's not any, that's not, there's no SQL coding courses in PNG, but it was something that I, I felt I needed to do because I needed to get the information much faster. And that kind of mentality is one of the things that actually helped us do things in a more agile way. Now, specifically to your question around making decisions in a knee-jerk way given how real-time the data is, it's all about projecting the outcome of your plan. And I think this is one of those things which I found to be super, super useful in Circle Slide. And I'll start with an analogy wherein when I was reading about this, basically we, we had some, we had a new person come in and then he was telling us all about this. And then he was giving us a training how to think about this. The whole concept is, is around leading and lagging indicators. And to some, some people might actually just think of it as like a, 
TPS or like a Gantt chart, but it's really not that. But the way to think about it is if, you know, with leading and lagging indicator, you need to understand what is the, obviously the lagging outcome and backtrack what are leading indicators that predict that outcome. One great example that uh, um, I've read about this, which I think illustrates it in a really succinct way outside of business is, imagine you're trying to lose weight. Your lag outcome is the kgs that you've lost. Now, the leading indicator there would be the number of times you've gone to the gym, the number of times you've stuck to your diet, the number of times you've stepped out and taken a walk. Things like that would be leading indicators. And as with anyone who's tried losing weight, if all you're thinking about is looking at the weighing scale and, oh no, why, why am I still on the same number? Why hasn't it moved? But instead, focus on, oh no, why haven't I taken a walk today? Why haven't I gone to the gym? Why haven't I eaten properly? That will actually lead to a more predictable and more controllable outcome. So one example uh, I have here of uh, how we use it in Circles Life is if I'm able to, let's say one part of our, one, one part of our growth channels is really CRM. So when we send notifications to customers. So I can predict that if I send, let's say, to 1,000 people, how many of that will eventually convert? Because if I send to 1,000 people, I can predict based on prior averages, what is the open rate, what is the click-through rate, and what is the conversion rate. And if on that day that I sent it out, I'm not able to actually reach the lag outcome, which is the conversions or new customer sign-up, I can backtrack and understand was it the conversion rate, was it the click-through rate, or was it the open rate? And over time, I'm actually able to predict with higher level of certainty. And at the same time, I can focus on the right things because if the open rate is the problem, then I can focus the team, hey guys, come on, let's brainstorm and think of more subject lines. Which subject lines had like a, a higher open rate than which subject lines had the lower open rate? And then we can iterate and optimize against that, right? So for us, it's really about driving predictability in a complex environment. And this is never a perfect science because you have to iterate and understand. In some cases, you might realize that the leading indicator you thought was actually wrong. And the, the correlation and predictability of that to the lagging outcome might actually be off. Like just going back to the example on losing weight, you know, a lot of people think it's about exercise, exercise, exercise. But uh, at least what I've read, not a, not a nutritionist, so don't take my advice. Uh, but what I've read, like a bigger lever is actually what you eat, right? So then if you're focusing on the wrong leading indicator, you might actually feel frustrated and then not arrive at the lagging outcome that you want. So that's how we think about it. So based on that leading indicator, we can decide if this is likely to happen or not. And therefore, we don't need to have that knee-jerk reaction that just because the lagging outcome didn't happen today, within the hour, or within this week, if based on the leading metrics, we are on track, then we feel comfortable about keeping things on and uh, um, keeping tests on or keeping activities. Got it. So I think it's you know also um, one bit where which uh, all of us need to learn from um, from this is we don't necessarily need a lot of fancy tools to do a lot of the analysis, right? So it's about um, creating hacks to ensure that we're using data in the right way. And I think the the bit that you've spoken about the predictive modeling is is really really interesting because I think sometimes what happens is we set KPIs, which are the end KPIs for any campaign or for any marketing um, objective that we have, but we don't have the regular check-ins along the journey to see whether we're actually tracking and what are the various aspects to, uh, to look at. So I think um, I've definitely become a personal fan of the leading and uh, the, lagging, uh, the lagging indicators. So, you know, moving a little from, um, from the data and how you actually are using the data. One of the things that Circle Life um, has been known for in, um, in Singapore, at least, um, and in other countries, has been very bold in terms of creativity and um, pushing the boundaries when it comes to, comes to marketing. 
Um, there is this perception and this belief that bold and uh, contrarian creatives does not always deliver to business metrics, and it's more about you know PR stunt or or an award. But from everything that you've said, is that you know there is a process in the in the organization to ensure that everything is is measured. So talk us about the approach that you have in terms of challenging the norm when it comes to creativity. Um, yeah, so uh, I think first off, I want to you know just share um, something that I think might most people might find surprising. I'm not really a big fan of the of the very sentimental kind of marketing which uh, brands will do to associate to a particular cause. I think those kind of things, especially when I was in PNG, I would always look at them very pessimistically. Uh, as a as a way to just win awards, which you know, if that was the objective, that's fine. Um, but when it comes to helping me ship my cases for that month, I would not be confident in uh, that particular creative being able to drive incrementality there. So, what's changed in my thinking since I joined Circle Life? The biggest one I would say is being in a constant David and Goliath fight wherever we play. And one of the things I remember back in 2016 was when we were much smaller, even though we were insignificant compared to Singtel scale, we were already getting a lot of DLC from them, uh, as well as from Starhub. And I was thinking about how it took Airbnb and Uber years, maybe in maybe well beyond them getting to unicorn status before their respective incumbents took the fight to to their doorstep, right? So I've, I, I found that quite encouraging, in fact. It's almost like, hey, I'm actually a serious threat, even though I'm just like um, a small fry at the moment. Um, but that really made us think of ways to be able to fight this battle earlier on um, than later. And we thought about stuff that will set us apart from the incumbents and specifically contrarian things. Like what are the specific things that we can do that they cannot do? Obviously, I cannot spend billions of dollars on building the brand and doing these kind of sexy things in marketing uh, because that's, that's their thing. They have billions of dollars. I don't have billions of dollars. So I have to do things that they cannot do. So that's where things like um, doing provocative things had to come into play. Because if I don't have a billion dollars, if I don't have a war chest, I have to get my message across in a way that cuts through. And what do I have? I have nothing. I have nothing to lose. That's what I had. So uh, we, we did our best to go out and do crazy bets. In fact, one of the things that we, uh, at least a team would kind of joke around about is, is this bet crazy enough to send Delbert to the police station? Which I have been on quite a few number of occasions, uh, explaining why we were doing certain things. Um, imagine spending two hours explaining to the police why you're giving away free money. It's, uh, it's not the best use of your time. Uh, but it, was a, it, it still serves as a pretty funny anecdote from time to time. But yeah, like that's how we think about it. And uh, the, 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 the counterpoint to that, which I find really interesting in how we approach it is, while we do these crazy things, in fact, majority of our money is actually not spent on these crazy things. Because it's all about hedging the risk. Not all crazy, thing that you, crazy things that you do will work. Some of them will go viral, some of them will be meh, some of them will, you know, achieve some, like, some level of result. But you have to hedge your bet by not putting the whole budget into that crazy thing. If you're betting your whole budget in that crazy thing, then that creates negative pressure in terms of the creative output. Because then it will push people to do the safe choices even within that crazy thing. 
So that's the kind of thing that we try to avoid, wherein whenever we try to do a crazy thing, we hedge the bet by continuing to do the things which are bread and butter, like retargeting, SEM ads, Facebook, paid social, video, all of these things which talk about very specific circumstance things, very talks about a promotion, talks about pricing, talks about how easy it is to sign up, very boring, non-sexy, non-crazy. But if you combine that with doing something interesting and where you are actually leaning forward, you can actually come up with a good combination of both a risky and a safe play. So that's how we think about it. And that's how we hedge against these crazy things. And the way we see incrementality come from that is because our brand is relatively much smaller than the incumbents that we're playing against. When we do something crazy or when we do something contrarian, the incrementality to the brand conversation is much, much higher as opposed to something that is much more established. So we do see higher incrementality from that. And from time to time, we do have to change tactics. Like in Singapore, early on, we would do a lot of these things and then uh, not really brand it a circle stuff. And then there's some kind of mystery. And then the journalists would pick up uh, try to investigate, oh, oh, who is it, who is it, who is it, and then eventually it would be re revealed as us. Eventually they caught on, or at least I think they did, so we had to change uh, tactics. But the way we think about it is it still goes back to doing the things that your competition can and betting on the resource that you have, which they don't have. In, in our case, uh, we still think we have nothing to lose. That's why we're still going with the uh, these crazy ideas. Got it. So take the risk and hedge your bets against the risk that uh, that you are taking. So the last question that I have, and we've getting quite a few question uh, Q and A's as well from from the audience, is how would you define the culture of the marketing organization? Um, I would say the culture of the marketing organization in Circles Life is it's. The number one thing is, and it sounds so uh, stereotypical, so I apologize if it's so basic, but it's about getting things done. And there is power in getting things done because when you have done the thing that you have committed to doing, even if it's not the exact same thing that you've promised, there is power to that. And it's actually, it sounds so basic, but it's actually a really, really difficult thing because in everything that we say that we're going to do, there's always going to be a blocker. Someone's always going to say, oh, what about this? What about that? What about this? What about that? There's this thing. This person doesn't want to cooperate. So then you need to think about how to still get that thing done in some shape or form. So, and I think the team is really strong when it comes to that. They, they see, because that's where the creative thinking comes in. If I cannot get through in this way, can I do a detour? Can I do a similar activity, but in a slightly smaller scale? So I think that's the first thing. Um, the second thing is the team um, is not afraid of uh, making big bets, uh, taking chances. That's something that, you know, one of the things I tell people I hire is if you want to join Circle Life, make sure you're uh, comfortable with um, being set up for failure. And that might sound like a really unappetizing proposition to sign up for, but with targets and with aspirations as ambitious as ours, if you don't feel that you're in a position that is, is looks insurmountable, then you know you're not stretching yourself enough or this might not be the right place for you. So. I, I make sure the team that I hire and the team that we have in place are people who are comfortable with that, comfortable with the, like having a Goliath in front of you, because that is the, that is the context that we face day in and day out. Um, I would say the third thing is really around resiliency. Um, one thing I was sharing with the team the other day, and it's 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 going to appear on one of our employer branding videos where. Me as a talking head is uh, will be talking about how amazing Circle Life is, but I was I was talking about how you form a certain kind of bond with the team, 
when you're in a kind of situation which is really crazy, like uh, you feel you're down in the trenches day in and day out with them. And this forms a certain level of bond. And I, I again, I hate to use like such a basic term as family. Uh, I prefer what Netflix uses, which is like a high performance team. You know, if you're in a high performance team, imagine if you were part of the, I don't know, like a, a championship team in a particular sport of your choosing. I, I watch basketball, so I can imagine if you're part of that particular sport. Even if you've left the team, you will always look back, oh, during this season, you know, we were like the best, you know, we beat everyone. And that's a kind of um, emotion I feel day in and day out working with the team. And that's kind of bond that we're all formed because of all the trials and tribulations that we've gone through together from Singapore, launching Australia and Taiwan, to getting Indonesia off the ground, and all the fires we've had to fight uh, in between. It's been a crazy journey, and I think, uh, yeah, that I would say that's the, the last thing. Excellent. So be resilient. Don't be afraid to take chances and just ensure that you get it done. That's, that's yeah. the mantra that we follow. Great. And with that, um, I'm going to open it up to, um, to questions. So we've already got a few, which I'll start off with. Um, so the first one that we've got is using the example of the change in sign-up pages. How did you use data to convince the business stakeholders to make the changes? Sorry, can you say that again? Um, the change in which one? So using the example of the change to the sign-up page in the credit card okay. example at the start. So how do you use data to convince the business stakeholders to make the changes? Okay, um, I have a very easy uh, answer to that. Um, I was a business decision maker, so yes, we should do it. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, but so in that case yes but I think just to understand I'm I'm guessing the question is coming from a position wherein there might not be the business the way we think about it is in any kind of environment resources are always constrained in a tech kind of company engineering resources are, are always in constraint so you have to be really choiceful with what kind of development that you want to prioritize. And the way we think about this and the way I would approach it in an organization where this person might not be the decision maker is, first of all, I would show the case for why this is a potential volume driver. So in this way, using the example that I shared, if we are getting, let's say, 100 people on this page where people are putting in their credit cards, and then we're only getting 50 people like afterwards, like 50 people actually completing that part, you're seeing a 50% drop off there. Therefore, you need to understand why. So that is like initial case for why we need to think about this. And if because by that, by that logic, you can extrapolate that, you know, you can potentially double your business if you fix this process. Because someone who gets to that level has super high intent. You cannot ask for a better level of intent from a particular customer. No one puts their credit card details and then decides not to, you know, go through with it. At least like majority will want to go through with it. So that's the first part. The second part is you should think about if depending on what the implementation is or the execution of the change will be, you should think about how to do a low fi pilot. How do you fake it? In fact, you, so we think a lot about how to do these hacky, lo-fi, big door stuff because engineering resources are so tight. If I mistakenly get the engineers to work on something that doesn't actually deliver results, I've not just wasted their time. I've wasted a potential opportunity cost in terms of another thing I could have had them work on, right? So think about that. So one example that um, I remember sharing with Monica the other day is we wanted to come up with this new kind of plan. Um, and for us to test it out, because building a new plan, while it's pretty straightforward from our side, given the technology backing, it still requires some dev work. So you know what we did? We did the, uh, a basic email campaign with the Google form in it to understand if people would want to sign up. So 
we thought of what is the hackiest way and we were thinking as if we were a company with like uh, five engineers, not the 200 that we have, right? So we think about it always at that level. And then from there, we can make a much stronger business case. Got it. And I think we have time for one last question, which is, um, which can be a quick one, which is, what is the buzzword you never want to hear again? Um, I, for me, the buzzword that I never want to hear again is, um, I would say, machine learning. Whenever I hear machine learning, uh, I, I, I kind of grip my teeth and kind of, um, yeah, like it's just, uh, I, like people throw it around um, in so many, like actually, you know, there's even a joke, right? We're in. Um, you put machine learning in your pitch, whether you're actually doing machine learning, you get an, like you get incrementality in terms of valuation. So it's 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 to that level of uh, of 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 cringiness. So we do have machine learning in some shape or form that I'm not technical enough to understand it. But uh, yeah, that's but when when it's just talked about, it's just hyped up so much that uh, um, it's it's it's. It's just cringy to me. But yeah, that's how I think about it. Yeah, but you just killed a lot of people's hopes where it was like machine learning is the next big thing that we know now we cannot talk to you uh, about it. Thank you so much. It's been um, wonderful having you and you know having this conversation with you. And I'm sure our viewers and listeners have got um, a little bit of a preview into the secret source of, um, of Circle's life. So thank you so much for, um, for your time. And over to you, Laura. Awesome. Thank you both so much, Delbert. I've learned uh, I've learned loads. Uh, I'm, I'm busy writing down hacks that I can do, um, and I promise not to mention machine learning to you uh, in the future. Uh, but thank you both so much. Um, just to put on everyone's radar uh, for our next webinar, which is happening next Wednesday, the 15th of July, we're actually turning the spotlight away from telco and into um, the health and pharma industry and seeing how uh, COVID in particular has impacted um, two giant brands, Bayer and Mundi Pharma. So please do sign up on our website um, to join that next week. Delbert, Monica, again, thank you all. So, thank you both so much. We really do appreciate it. Um, and thank you for your sharing. Well, thank you, Laura. Thank you, Monica. Uh, and thank you, Jeanette, for uh, setting this all up. It was a pleasure. So if Anyone else has any questions, uh, feel free to just uh, add me on LinkedIn. Happy to engage, happy to uh, discuss more. Thank you, everyone. Thank you.